move on to Mukul Sharma, who is professor at the Indian Institute of Mass Communication, a former journalist and writer on caste, nationalism, human rights, environment, and who straddles English and Hindi in his work. So thank you very much. And thank you, Ravi and Max Muller Bhavan for inviting me here. I will be speaking on uh, caste, nature, and Dalits. Uh, we know nature is natural world, considered as natural and universal, common and applicable to all, endowed with wide, uncountable varieties of human species, animal, plants, land, consisting of all things. And we also know how caste is divisive, hierarchical human world, considered as constructed, distinct historical and social entity, unique to India, and based on a system of stratification and division of Hindu society. We also broadly understand the diversity, multiplicity, elasticity in the meaning of nature and environment. We are also aware of the historicity, complexity, uh, disparity in theory and practice of caste in India. However, do we know that both caste and nature could be intertwined and interconnected? Have we ever thought of them together in our academic exercise? How do I see them intertwined and interlocked? Environmental academician and activists of various kind have focused on increasing alienation and displacement of the poor from their resources and unequal burdens imposed on them for development and modernization of the country. Feminist and anthropologist have raised critical question about the naturalness of the natural order and pointed out how layers of power work within gender, caste, and nature. However, Nature and its social history have rarely been seen from a caste angle. The politics of caste in India, in the realm of nature, and its implication and meanings for Dalits have been a blind spot. My hypothesis today is that caste and nature are intimately interwoven in India. I see the of course, this interconnectedness from a Dalit lens. Though the category of Dalit itself does not mean a singular identity or a united homogeneous bias and practice. I will come to this a bit later. Let me take you to now a few Dalit writings to give you glimpses of Dalit experiences and expression about nature. And this is also my new work. Uh, we know many well-known Dalit writers, their autobiographies, uh, much discussed and researched. Take a few autograph autobiographies of a few prominent Dalit authors from different backgrounds, regions, and language, uh, like Bama, Manohar Mali Viswas, Om Prakash Balmiki, Sharan Kumar Limble, Sidha Lagnaya from, Kar from Karnataka. In her autobiography, Bama, the first ever Indian T Tamil Dalit woman writer describes herself as karaku, means palmera leaves, with their serrated edges on both sides. <laughs> like a double-edged sword challenging its operation. Her life of cruel caste operation within the Catholic Church was like that of a bird whose wing had been clipped and her recovery from social and institutional betrayal felt like a falcon that treads the air high in the skies. Manohar Mali Biswas, a Bengali Dalit writer from the West Bengal state, writing for over three decades, thought of himself as a writer, as a, as a water hyacinth in, her, in his autobiography. Initially, he named his autobiography as Prisnika, meaning water hyacinth. Later, he renamed it as life and death of Prisnika. While expressing this self-identity self was deeply hurtful to him, the world of 
डॉक्टर सीधा लंगैया वन ऑफ इंडियाज फोरमोस्ट दलित राइटर इन कर्नाटका स्टेट ब्रीथ्स एंड डाइज इन ओरुक्वेरी ए सेपरेट स्पेस इन ए विलेज और इन ए सिटी वेर ए दलित रिसाइड्स सो मच सो दैट हिज ऑटोबायोग्राफी इज टाइटल ऑन हिज लिविंग प्लेस वी कैन गेट इन टू सम मोर डिटेल्स अबाउट देयर राइटिंग वामा राइट्स इन हर ऑटोबायोग्राफी आई कोट भैरव इज ए फ्रेल रिवर वी कॉल डिट ए फीमेल रिवर जस्ट एट द ट्रेडिंग बोर्ड्स ऑफ द पैडी सेलर्स फ्लोटेड डाउन भैरव सो डिट द ट्रेडिंग बोर्ड्स ऑफ द जूट सेलर सम वन वुड लाइट ए स्टोव अंडर द चौकी एंड कुक इन ट्राइंग टू लाइट द फायर विथ अ स्ट्रॉ हिज फोर्स फेस वुड बी लैस्ट बाई अ स्मोक वेन द विंड ब्लू फ्रॉम द अपोजिट डायरेक्शन वेब्स ब्रोक ऑन द बैंक्स द वॉटर ऑफ दिस रिवर वेयर मडी इन वोकिंग कंपैशन लाइक लुकिंग एट द पेल फेस ऑफ ए वुमेन इन पेन इट वॉज एज इफ इट वेयर क्राइंग ए पेन समवेयर इन दिस बॉडी अनकोट बामा रिमेंबर्स हिज लाइफ इन माउंटेन जंगल फॉरेस्ट वेयर सी कलेक्टेड फायरवुड and the hard and cruel life of a low caste woman she recounts how she was forced to survive on forest and how she had to give money to the forester to allow her to correct uh, firewoods uh, twigs and thorns scratched and tore her face sometimes her skin started bleeding or her hair got entangled in the branches almost splitting her skull she often pushed shoved and crawled her way through bushes and briars there is a specificity of labored nature here which is quite different from the universal question of accessing nature land forest river water agriculture village occupation food have been important sites for imposition of hierarchies of caste in his autobiography Sharan Kumar Limble is disturbed about his land and place I quote the scorching sun dogs with their tongues lolling in the heart heat utterly charmless children an old hag smoking holes in the crumbling wall of the house drunkards stumbling along what else was there in my locality to interest one unquote nature is also an exercise of power in the hands of the powerful and is entangled in the politics of belonging and alienation exclusion and inclusion through environmental othering taboos of social population creation of a social ecology making dirt and filth as an existential companion of certain communities nature can become a medium and message of power where caste and nature overlap in the hands of the dominant and the powerful nature appropriates dominates subjugates spaces places identities reflecting on this interrelationship between nature and caste power and place limble writes about his school i quote play over we settle down to eat boys and girls from the high caste like wani brahmin marwari muslim maratha teli fisherman goldsmith and all the teachers about 100 or so sat in a circle under a banyan tree we the mahar boys and girls were asked to sit under under another tree even the tree we sat under was tattered like us whenever the wind shook the branches it produced waves of hot air that hit our faces we sat in its broken shadows unquote nature casted in caste mirrors the subjugated status of dalits it is imagined and reimagined worked and reworked distinctly in dalit environmental narratives they see themselves in water river land agriculture which are marked by hierarchy pain and powerlessness manohar mauli viswas defines himself through nature while also pointing to its social order i quote the people born in nature lived in their own way and even died in their own way the name of this history of life and death is prisnika growing up like the water hyacinth and dying like it uncared for i was born into such a community and that is how i grew up in my deprived childhood among the river unquote so 
What when images of land animate caste anxieties, labor, blood, and bondage? Or in dry regions, when Dalits remember sacrificing their lives to recharge ponds and water resources? When from village to city, from temple to school, caste metaphors of pollution, impurity, and dirt dominate places and spaces through imaginaries of dangers posed by the presence of untouchables. What when forests can be heaven or hell? When nature is entwined with fear and violence, horror and hardship, blood, wrath and war, when caste dominates environmental experiences, then the environmental experiences and expression will be distinctive and different. Thus, we are faced with many other questions while uh, understanding about in nature and environmental pol politics. How are caste hierarchies reproduced by uses of nature? What is the role of purity and pollution? What are the structuring principles of access and exclusion? Is it a question of touchability or hierarchy in general? Are other principles of caste hierarchy besides the touchability also in operation here? What is the caste of water? How is the caste relation structure irrigation networks in a village? Why should Dalit feel and work for the conservation and promotion of traditional water bodies and water harvesting systems when these leave aside the issues of ownership they are not even allowed to take water from these ponds, wells, and tanks. Why and how do caste and its culture determine pure and unpure food? What we eat and what we prefer not to eat? How is the use of animals declared legitimate or illegitimate through caste? Why should Dalits fight for the restoration of traditional community-based occupations when it is precisely these occupations that support their ghettoization and do not empower them or improve their situation in civil society and the market? How does a specific environmental and occupational setup play a role in the making and unmaking of the collective entry or exit of a, ca of a caste in environmental politics? How do certain environmental arenas, for example, the tank irrigation technologies and practices in South India, explicate caste and Dalit intersections at the site of environment. How do physical and social environment, characterized by different names and untouchability, act as a material context for Dalit environment subject, subject formation? What does it mean when labor, rather than leisure, is your central ecological experience, and the labor work is compounded by the inconvenient history of bondage and, and pain? Now, coming back to uh, uh, caste and nature, similar to nature, hierarchical social structure are often believed by many caste Hindus to be organic, intrinsic, and natural, originating together and at the same momentum of creation of universe, by and out of the sacrifice of the body of Purusha, the primeval man. However, scholars have also pointed out that not only caste, but even land, forest, and water are complex historical and social products. Vast form of nature bear the marks of human influence, including caste exclusion, from the times of Rig Veda, naturalizing an unequal social order, to the recent intellectual debates on caste dimensions and determinants of human behavior, caste and nature have often met through diverse path, time, and sphere. Uh, let me take you to one path, one time, and a sphere. Uh, according to the Rig Veda, as I mentioned, uh, uh, this is the famous thing, how Brahmin came, Kshatriya came, Vaishya came, and Suddha came. The universe, moon and sun, sky and ocean, people and their existence naturalized Varnasram or Chatur Varna system, in which people were believed to be born with natural characteristics and inclination towards a particular occupation. Thus, caste creates a concept of natural and social order where people, place, occupation, knowledge are characterized by the pollution and ritual cleanliness, where bodies, behavior, situation, actions are isolated. 
uh, out of place, untest. Second, caste shapes environmental attitude and values of both Brahmins and non-Brahmins. Third, caste makes it possible for Brahmins to appropriate and exploit natural resources by segregating and subordinating certain sections of the population. And fourth, low caste, the untouchables, develop their own understanding of nature and its resources, which were co-habitation of love and sorrow, pain and joy, alienation and attachment. Now go to another path, uh, time and sphere, which I call the path of eco-casteism, which represents a distinctive form of Indian environmentalism today, which is often grounded in a justification of the caste system and a simultaneous opposition to modernity and enlightenment under an overarching broad rubric of social ecological system, caste, division of labor, traditional occupation is sometimes seen as a progenitor of the concept of sustainable development. It has thus been argued by some, none other than Madhav Gargil and Ram Guha, that caste system signified conservation from below, a remarkable system of ecological adaptation, and high level of uh, specialization where caste groups in a web of mutually supportive relationship help resource conservation. So there are various uh, other, uh, other uh, example of this eco-casteism. Such meaning of caste associated, accompanied with views on relationship with, uh, between human and nature, interact with some other sub-theme, which I call eco-organicism and eco-naturalism, and have critical bearing on eco-casteism. Eco-organicism is an Indian approach to nature, and have, where environment is understood as divine, cosmic, and intrinsic, conforming to the laws of nature. Society is viewed as natural, based on natural principles, whereby modernity, industry, science, technology are described as Western, materialist, consumerist, and thus unnatural and uncultured. In such understanding, Indian environment is believed to be under threat from outside forces. Therefore, protection of environment is synonymous with protection of Indian culture, tradition, nation. Uh, Indian culture here consists comprehensively of our family, customs, faith, rituals, ceremonies, social system, value, and ethics. Now, eco-naturalism is the coupling of environmental protection with the protection of life in its natural order. According to this view, humans have wrongly considered themselves as above nature, where they should be viewed as in nature, which is rich, permanent, and cultured, and often provides national values to guide human action. There can be several versions of eco-naturalism. I'm not um, uh, touching here uh, because of time. Uh, but, but if you take one example, that is food, which is a marker of eco-naturalism, uh, uh, natural, um, which also a marker of Hindu Brahmanical belief. Uh, for example, food is a part of the ultimate reality Brahmin. It is culturally given, along with the designated social, social ritual uh, phases, according to which multiple schemes of food classification establish rules about eating and feeding within this framework. Uh, I leave the uh, quotation. Uh, so, uh, purity and pollution of our body, touch, taste, space, place, and people, as I said, are key markers of caste, creating essential qualities and differences within and outside of the nature escapes. Nature itself cannot determine the identity of a place, but caste create a natural essence, an ambience, to establish power relations and social order. Thus, we have vast landscapes of purity and pollution in India that maintain strict lines for caste identity, dominance, and exclusion, from sacred groves to natural water bodies, from village to city, these demarcations between cultured and uncultured, holy and unholy, natural and unnatural, are, are very much active and alive through natural, natural and social uh, disposition. In conclusion, what I, I would say that nature is 
life essential, but naturalism of several kind is questionable. Nature and caste, both are historical and social creations. Through locating a dialectical relationship between caste, nature, and Dalit, one can revisit nature on caste and cultural carriers. Even while being part of nature, the effects of humans on nature is huge. As nature is made in India, it can equally be casted in caste. Have been, has been naturally histori historically naturalized through nature. Rather than adopting a caste-blind vision, a consciousness about caste in nature can help us create a new political space for environmental uh, struggle. By exploring different subject formation in relation to environment, as well as by opening the public secrets of secular environment hood, we can bring the reading and understanding of caste, Dalit, and nature together at different times and locations, exploration of interrelationship between gender and nature, race and nature, ethnicity and culture, gender and caste, class and power have opened up new political possibilities. Thank you. We move on to Ram Ramaswamy, professor in the School of Physical Sciences at JNU, New Delhi. President of Indian Academy of Sciences, Bangalore, Ram. Thank you, Abhik, and thank you to uh, to all. No, no, I'm just trying to settle in and uh, figure out an introduction or an introductory phrase, which is uh, that after the poetic and the passionate. Um, this is going to be somewhat prosaic, <laughs> and um, this is not an apology, but it's just fact. So let me uh, get my presentation on board, and uh, uh, okay. Uh, I, I took the brief sent to me uh, somewhat seriously, and I. So my presentation is about nature, matter, and technology, and not as grounded in uh, India and the Indian reality as uh, many of the others. But I will come to that uh, at the end because one is, after all, a practitioner over here. Uh, <laughs> the, um, the underlying conceit of much of our present civilization, and I subsume the Western in ours and ours in the Western, is that uh, all the effects of nature, the world around us, are only the mathematical consequences of a small number of immutable laws. Now, this is, of course, a very arrogant statement. It's a conceit that has, that is, Laplace is French and a few hundred years old, um, but, <laughs> But this belief underlies all of, all of us physical scientists that laws of nature are few, the really good ones, uh, and the really good ones are those that are simple and elegant. And um, it is another widely held conviction that nature should be described through something which is simple and elegant and not messy. And, disgusting. Uh, so symmetry, some kind of, uh, of parallelism, whatever, you know, interpret it in the way that you like. And economy, the fewer things that you need in order to describe uh, the reality, that is valued. So since I knew that Abhik was a moderator and my only memory of him 25 years ago is that he studied Keats, um, I thought that I would tell you that this is also, this could equally well be the scientist's credo, that beauty is truth and truth is beauty. By truth, I would take it to be physical laws, uh, that we find a lot of beauty in it, symmetry, elegance, uh, economy, uh, and 
that's nature, that's all you know on earth and all you need to know and that is what we try to describe this world by. Now, this is a, as I said, it is a conceit, but this is what uh, Galileo, who uh, is responsible for much of modern science, uh, actually believed, and he said it in, uh, in his writing, that the book of nature is written in mathematical language and its characters are triangles, circles, and other geometric figures without which it is impossible to humanly understand a word. Without these, one is wandering in a dark labyrinth. And the Greeks uh, before uh, introduced us to the idea of the most symmetric uh, uh, objects, these are the platonic solids, the tetrahedron, the octahedron, the cube. And uh, there was a view of cosmology uh, that was put forth by Johannes Kepler that uh, actually the planets were arranged in these platonic solids, that there was nested platonic solids uh, which enclosed the orbits of, uh, of the planets as we know them. Now, these were nice ideas, but I, what I wanted to convey is that the quest for understanding and simplicity um, resulted in a kind of systematization where you impose a certain type of order on what you see. The world is this way, it is so because of beauty or symmetry or circles or ellipses as in the case of Kepler and so on. And in the 1600s, of course, this gave rise to uh, the Newtonian paradigm from where we sort of really start with the mathematization of physical phenomena. Newton, I mean, as all of you know, uh, was uh, responsible for elucidating the uh, gravitational law based on the studies of Galileo and Kepler and observations that they had grounded their work on, um, he developed the calculus, the methodology of reckoning, of, uh, and uh, he was able to systematize it. He introduced us to uh, mathematical language, differential equations, and so on. And in this, uh, in the Principia, the uh, 1687 work, he laid out in mathematical motions the principles of time, force, and motion. We are all, I think, conversant at least with Newton's laws. They've been enunciated to us time and again by our, uh, by our politicians. Um, you know, every action has an equal and opposite reaction, uh, and so on. It was a joke. <laughs> Uh, no, but it's true. I mean, it is in the, in the language of, uh, of, you know, common parlance uh, that, you know, that we have such things. But Newton's, uh, actually Newton's law, his fundamental discovery was a very simple one. And the fundamental discovery describes our world. And that is that for mechanical objects, for objects that move, if you know where they are, and if you know what their velocity is, that is how fast they are moving and in which direction, that indeed is all you need to know. <laughs> the future is uniquely predicted by the position and the velocity. You can mathematize it and write differential equations and so on and so forth, but this is such a beautiful thing. Or perhaps we have learned to see the beauty in it that if you know the position and the velocity, everything else is a consequence. It's a function of the position and the velocity. So this simple statement actually underlies, in my view, uh, the, the principles and the philosophy behind much of science and technology over the last you know, few centuries. We take observation, we convert them into laws which are simple, enunciate them, and then you calculate. And once you calculate, you can predict, you can control, and these are the ways in which we have built um, 
engines, we have built cars, we've built all sorts of wonderful devices based on, uh, we built clocks, we've learned how to tell time. All this is a consequence, from my point of view, on the observations and the laws enunciated by people like Galileo and Newton and so on, and of course their developments subsequently. It's crucial that technology is dependent upon laws that are predictable, because if I know that a certain bridge will yield so much when a truck of so many tons goes over it, then I would like to know how much it will yield when a truck of twice the weight goes over it, and I need to have well-defined laws and rules. It cannot be that on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, it will work like so, and, and so on, right? So, it's fine, but we know that many of these laws are really somewhat approximate, and we are also familiar with when you can apply certain laws. So it begs the question, what is the true nature of the world around us? Is Newtonian physics and that simple way of thinking, is that all there is? Is there something more? I'm sure that all of you read the papers and you'll all hear about string theory and about how these wonderful, uh, you know, what is the true theory of everything and dark matter and dark energy and neutrinos and so on. But what we would like to know is what is real, what is what is the true nature of stuff? What's it really like out there when you come small or whatever? All right? What is the most appropriate mathematical framework uh, within which a proper description of nature? Now, of course, I don't mean nature quite in the sense that it has been used for the rest of the day uh, and yesterday, but it's also nature. What's it really like out there? So questions like these have long dominated the landscape of the physical sciences, and the physical sciences have been so influential in enabling us finally to come where we are. In, in a well-lit room, transported here by aeroplanes, cars, and so on, not possible without Newton. And it's obvious that many of these laws are only approximate. Now, this view, the systematization that is promised in a, in a predictable, orderly uh, universe, largely coming from that time, this systematization has been challenged. And it's been challenged in many ways. You all have all heard of the quantum revolution and relativity and so on. But there's been another revolution that has happened, uh, largely in the 50s, 60s, and thereafter. And this is uh, what's loosely called chaos theory and nonlinear science. But let me just say that what people have realized is that the appropriate mathematics to describe much of nature turns out to be nonlinear, which basically means that double the cause, you don't get double the effect. Uh, linearity would would have a linear relationship, so twice of something leads to twice of something else, whereas nonlinearity, twice of something maybe leads to half, maybe leads to a hundred times, so we don't know. Now, there is a profound implication of these developments, both for our understanding of nature, and now I also mean the other nature, not just nature reality, but, and also our reality, and for how this impacts technology. For example, if the physical world was described by you know, simple natural laws, why is it so difficult to predict the weather? Now, this is a question that underlies much of, you know, it's very important, it's important for crop, uh, crops, and, and it's good to know when to leave Kerala or when to rush there, etc. So, uh, no, <laughs> you know, so uh, it would be nice to have better weather prediction, just for example, or it would be nice to know when the next person is going to have a heart attack and why and so on and so forth. Right, so we'd like to know certain things you'd like to be able to predict. It turns out that there is, uh, there is a science that is emerging, a, a field which is called chaos theory, 
And there's been considerable progress in understanding how things become irregular. Because it's obvious that the weather is irregular and it's obvious that many things are not nearly as smooth as you want them to be. And when you understand how things become irregular and their consequences both in space and time, you have a better understanding of, of reality. It turns out that many, many systems can behave in a manner which is almost as random as tossing a coin. Most of us use the idea of a coin toss to, uh, you know, something is equally probable to be heads or tails, but many systems, instead of, you know, if I were to drop this object from here, it, it, this one is not going to go up, but it seems that some systems behave like this. And this has become famous in the public sphere as something known as the butterfly effect. Uh, there's been movies named, you know, I think called the butterfly effect and so on. But let me just say that what is believed to underlie something as complicated as the weather is this chaos. And it's typified by the statement that the flapping of the wings of a butterfly in the Amazon, uh, something as mind-numbingly small can perhaps in time set off a snowstorm in New York. That is to say, a small change very, very far away can have huge consequences and the uncertainty can be very, very large. And this is why this behavior is called chaos. This has impacted technology. Can chaos theory help to predict heart attacks? So people do try to do, uh, to predict and perhaps to control. The controlling aspect of us as physical scientists is always there. Because if you understand something, you can hopefully either tame it or use it or do something with it. But I want to just turn to, uh, to another aspect of nature, and that nature abounds with complex patterns. Things are not as simple as all that. I mean, they're beautiful, but there's a sunflower, and there's broccoli, and there's a fern, and cacti. So this kind of beautiful, uh, you know, patterns that come up in nature, where is the statement of Galileo that we must have triangles and uh, circles and so on? So here, what is the mathematical language that we need? So. I will, I'll take just two minutes more. So uh, Benoit Mandelbrot, who invented this entire repertory, repertory of fractals, uh, he's pointed out that clouds are not spheres, uh, mountains are not cones, clouds are not spheres because they are partridge wings or women <laughs> carrying, no, coastlines are not circles and bark, the bark of a tree is not smooth. Lightning doesn't travel in straight lines. So perhaps it's a little too demanding of simple geometry to describe nature completely. And this complex organization of fractals, what Mandelbrot talked about, was a recursive construction of detail within detail within detail within detail ad infinitum. This has appeared in the work of Rohini. Uh, Come on, that's how I got to know you, Rohini. So, uh, but you can see this in this image close-up of the broccoli. You can see the broccoli repeating itself several times over. Now, this has been a part of our consciousness, and here I'm being subcontinental on this, uh, and I just thought I will give you two images, I will share two images with you. Um, the Tibetan mandalas where you have geometric objects inside geometric objects inside geometric objects, this repetitive structure that we find uh, in, I mean, this is not the best example of it, this is just what was on Wikipedia. Um, but you have very nice, uh, you know, the concept that there is nested levels of detail uh, in nature, in our universe and so on, this has been with us for a long time. It's also been there in our architecture, a temple architecture, uh, in some of the more complex temples, and this is from Khajuraho, uh, the Kandariya Mahadev temple. Uh, and, and, but the work is not, uh, the work is from South Korea, right? But so it's abstract. Uh, 
the temple itself is reproduced down to several levels, you know, images of that of the main, uh, the main, uh, the temple shape is there repeated and repeated and repeated, uh, not down to the absolute last level, but several layers down. So this kind of organization, uh, I was just comparing it to the broccoli, all right? No, well, I mean, you could have chosen to have anything else, but what the architects have done is to actually faithfully reproduce exactly the smaller one and blown it up and blown it up and so on. So the fractality is, uh, I mean, people have written a, a scientific paper about it, so, and it's in a paper on architecture, so, so it's, it's not about, you know, great Hindu, whatever, right? Now, there is an underlying message to what the physical scientists would say about nature, and that is that it has to be described by mathematics, and that there are uh, laws, laws of physics. Uh, Wigner said this most eloquently, uh, where he says that the language is appropriate, but we have to hope that it remains valid and we need to know. Now, after yesterday's uh, presentation uh, by uh, Akhil and uh, and by Bernd, uh, and also for your generosity, your cognitive generosity, um, Akhil, uh, you introduced me to these terms. Uh, so um, what I want to uh, just say that we are living in an age of big data. We are living in an age uh, where the information about our behavior, about our uh, movements, about everything that is constantly being transmitted uh, wherever. Now, with these extended observations, can new physical laws be discovered just from the way in which people are moving and behaving? So what has been applied so far to the physical world, the physical nature, can these kinds of laws also come up in the, other, in the rest of nature, in our nature? And this is both scary and of great promise uh, because we are transferring agency from ourselves to machines. It's the machines which seem to be learning about us. Okay. So let me stop here now. I've vastly overextended my time. <laughs>